Hi. I just noticed that the previous two podcasts in this section, I uh, didn't turn on the headphone, so it recorded from the uh, computer uh, uh, microphone, which sounds a little weird, but it's clearly audible, so I'm not going to re-record them. Sorry about that. Um, so we talked about these cloud ships, as the book calls them, a uh, nice fancy structure which has a way of pumping out uh, trillion droplets of sea salt. Uh, there are uh, uh, engineers involved in designing these things because when you have seawater trying to be sprayed like snowmaking, uh, you need the nozzle design to have the uh, liquid with gas uh, through it uh, going out so that the uh, nozzles don't get clogged and so on and so forth. So engineering aspects of it are quite interesting as well. Um, we talked about the, the stratus decks which are typically over these cold waters here. So you can see the temperature scale here. Uh, there is a uh, so-called Ekman divergence or the trade winds from the northeast and the southeast converge across the equator into the intertropical convergence zone that we will talk about in a minute. And that, because of the rotational effects or Coriolis effects, pushes the water away from the equator. The Coriolis pushes uh, things to the right of the direction of motion in the northern hemisphere, to the left of the direction of motion in the southern hemisphere. So on the equator, you're going right in the northern hemisphere, left in the southern hemisphere. So waters part like Moses did in the Red Sea, and then cold water has to come up. So the Galapagos and the co coasts of South America are cold. Uh, so cold waters also are here associated with uh, descent in the atmosphere, so you have these stratus clouds. So what is the point of uh, brightening clouds here? On the other hand, on this side you have very warm waters, the so-called Indo-Pacific warm pool here and the so-called coral triangle in between. Of course, Gulf of Mexico and parts of the um, Atlantic here are very warm and you can see that all these Red Sea, Persian Gulf, etc. of course. Um, you can see these are the coral sites. Uh, this is from this fr uh, article here. and. Already Great Barrier Reefs are getting a lot of attention because they have been bleached. They naturally bleach during strong uh, El Nino events, La Nina events, when there is a lot of uh, warming happens naturally. But global warming is acting on top of that and creating bleaching and uh, preventing corals from recovering and so on. So a community uh, of uh, Australian scientists uh, got permission to try cloud brightening experiments in uh, April 2020, I think, and they claimed success in the sense that they did manage to change the cloud optical properties and reduce the radiation falling on the br uh, barrier reef. It was done at a small scale and now they have plans to go back and do it on a larger scale. So here is the, the ship that went and did it. You can see the spray here and this is the machine on the deck that is uh, spraying out uh, salt to create cloud condensation nuclei. So that's the success which is consistent with the, um, the ship trails that we looked at which obviously produce uh, long, uh, uh, very long trailing uh, cloud brightness uh, properties as well. Okay, so in that sense, geoengineering experiment is already here, and since it is done to save the Great Barrier Reef, and there is a lot of support for it, uh, it will probably be tried again at a larger scale, and then data has to be collected to see, and modeling has to be done to see if there were remote and local unintended consequences. For example, if you end up reducing rainfall over Australia or something, then that's not going to be uh, very good. The next idea in terms of soggy mirrors is uh, called brightening the leaves. So genetically modifying the leaves, the wax uh, that they release and so on to actually uh, change the albedo. Vegetation tends to have a very dark albedo, a very a dark um, surface. Uh, albedo is much less over uh, the uh, vegetated sites compared to deserts, for example, or urban areas. So this is the crop fraction uh, interpret uh, uh, derived from uh, satellite data again, and you can see there are 
quite a few details here uh, over uh, parts of India, China, Europe, uh, Eurasia, and uh, America, South, South America, and North America, and so on. And the idea is that that gives you a sense of how much area is potentially available to modifying the albedo of the leaves. So this is showing the change in surface air temperature as anomaly for the experiments done uh, in the model <laughs> by changing the albedo properties of the uh, air, these uh, crop uh, fractions and you can see in December, January, February there is a slight bit of cooling here and there is a large cooling here which is uh, in the uh, <coughs> Arctic Circle away and over Greenland so obviously you have non-local impact of changing uh, vegetation albedo and this is for the summer months and you can see there are some spots where there is warming happening and you don't want warming in these Arctic circles and over Greenland and so on or over India. <coughs> there seems to be some relation here. Every time any geoengineering experiment is seen to cool parts of China, it is seen to warm parts of India and vice versa. So some local monsoon dynamics here has to be understood well to see uh, what the impacts are and we will see that there are also hemispheric impacts of doing uh, such experiments. So the impact of such large-scale cooling as we know from the volcanic eruptions as well is bound to have an impact on the hydrologic cycle and rainfall distribution. So this is the uh, consequence of rainfall distribution changes on the annual mean soil moisture anomaly. Uh, soil moisture can also directly change because when you cool the surface temperature you're going to cool change the latent heat exchange because the <coughs> relative <coughs> sorry, gradient of the uh, saturation moisture between the air and the soil is going to change which is going to determine, including the wind speeds, the uh, evaporative losses. So you can see that there is a large scale uh, soil moisture loss here over India, parts of Australia, Southeast Asia, uh, Sahel uh, and so on and so forth with increases in some other regions which basically means that there are uh, going to be unintended consequences when we do large-scale uh, crop brightening uh, for albedo, which is obviously still consistent with the dynamics we expect from volcanoes in terms of vulcan volcanoes cooling the troposphere and then having large-scale droughts as we saw during Pinatubo, especially over Sahel. You don't want this already poor uh, region which is semi-arid and arid uh, bordering on the desert to suffer more in terms of uh, rainfall. In fact, there is a very nice study reported by uh, Alessandra Giannini and uh, Ping Chang and uh, Saravanan uh, arguing that the extended multi-decadal drought over Sahel uh, from the 1940s to I think into the 1980s could be attributed to the ocean warming which was caused by industrial activities over US and Europe whereas that was initially blamed on overgrazing by the pastoralists and deforestation and so on so there have been unintended consequences of uh, unintended geoengineering experiments which we always have to watch out for but also learn from them and see if those same dynamics work when we do geoengineering by design and then see how they can be prevented, right? It's always tricky. <coughs>